Lesson 5.2 is proving trigonometric identities. So you may have thought you left proofs behind in geometry. However, you did not. We are proving things today. Now, the idea of the proof, they give you the starting place. They give us the ending place. We have to fill in the middle. How do those two pieces connect? Okay, so with this, and that's kind of how I'm going to have you start. So I'm going to, you know, kind of try and give you a beginning and say, okay, this is where we're ending. What can we make happen in the middle? We're going to start off with an algebraic one. Okay, so give you a brief break from the trig. But start off with algebraic. So our plan is here that we are starting with the left side of this. And our goal is we want it to equal the right side. So as I write this out, what I might say is, okay, I'm starting with the left of x squared minus 1 over x minus 1 minus x squared minus 1 over x plus 1. And my goal, and I'm just going to kind of work down here, my goal when I get to the end is I want it to equal 2. So you'll always see me, I'm kind of writing my goal at the bottom. And I'm not saying you guys have to do that, but that's where I'm headed is I want this to equal 2. My steps have to show how this happens. Not that just, you know, prove to me it equals 2. Don't just say, oh, it equals 2, believe me. Proof. So, question? Proofs are the ones that, like, you have to write out in words everything. It's like, because this is that, this becomes that. In geometry, it might have been more words. Here, it's more the math steps. Okay. We are, yeah, we're not really, we're not using words to do these proofs. Okay, good clarification point there. We're, you're just putting in the appropriate math steps. Okay, I'm not saying that, granted, I could say, okay, now put that in words. Okay, we added two to each thing or, you know, whatever we did, but no, I'm just expecting you to show me the math steps. So, thoughts as to what we can do with x squared minus 1 over x minus 1 minus x squared minus 1 over x plus 1. Now there's a couple different things we could talk about. I personally know what's going to be easiest, but there are several ideas that are valid ideas. So, Thoughts? Yeah. Okay. Can you break the x squared minus 1 into two parentheses? Hmm. That's going to be our best bet. Miles is suggesting taking x squared minus 1 and factoring it. Do you guys remember factoring x squared minus 1 into two parentheses? That's going to be your best bet here. My other possible suggestion is not the easiest, so I wasn't going to let us do it. But if we have two fractions being subtracted, could we go for a common denominator? That would be my other thought. However, the easier route is to factor the numerator. So this means don't be skipping steps on me, right? So we're going to write out what this is once we factor it. So x squared minus 1 factors into two parentheses, right? It's a difference of squares. x squared breaks into x times x. The square root of 1 is 1, so 1 and 1. And how do we multiply to be negative 1? Plus 1 minus 1. Still over the denominator, x minus 1. Second fraction. Can I factor that numerator the same way? x squared minus 1 factors into two parentheses. Square root of x squared is x, so x times x. Square root of 1 is 1, so 1 times 1. Again, multiplies to be negative 1, so plus and minus. This time it's over x plus 1. Okay, this is a step I feel like is necessary to show what you're thinking. Don't try and skip a bunch of steps in your head. Make me understand what's happening here. What do you see that can happen next? So what's in the numerator? Yeah, is there canceling that can happen? Yeah, on top, on the first fraction, there's x plus 1 times x minus 1. 
In the bottom, there's an x minus 1. A factor of x minus 1 on top cancels with the only factor of x minus 1 on bottom. What about the second fraction? A factor of x plus 1 on top cancels with the only factor of x plus 1 on bottom. So now, let's write out what we have. On the first one, I have x plus 1. Everything else leaves, right? You can put that x plus 1 in parentheses or not in parentheses. Either way would work on this part. Minus, this is a subtraction problem, what remains on the second? And that is x minus 1. Now, you will notice I am putting x minus 1 in parentheses. You either have to put that in parentheses right there, or the next step I'm going to do is to take that minus sign and distribute it, if you will. Does that make sense? Or maybe you could just go ahead and do your subtraction. But one way or the other, you have to be careful. This is not just minus x minus 1. So this is still x plus 1 minus x, and then minus negative 1 is really plus 1. What happens here? Okay. X is cancel. 1, x minus x cancels. 1 plus 1 is 2. Not that I had to write it again there, but did we make it? Did it happen? Yeah, we got this right here, like that was my goal, right? To equal 2. It's not really that you have to circle the equal 2 part, but like what I'm trying to point out to you is, okay, we made it. That was our goal. Our goal was equal 2. We made it happen. Questions there? That was algebra, right? No trig functions in there, just using algebra skills you already know. We're going to do trig, or trig proofs now. It's using the algebra skills with some, trig, with some trig properties thrown in. Okay, so keep those identities in mind. Keep all these trig properties we've been using in mind. But also keep the algebra in mind. Okay, believe, yes. Okay, so example two. Prove the identity. Tangent x plus cotangent x equals secant x cos times cosecant x. Okay. So here's what I'm going to set us up as. We are starting with tangent x plus cotangent x. What is my goal in the end? My goal in the end is for us to equal Secant x, cosecant x, when we get to the end. That's my goal. Okay, tangent plus cotangent. Think about all of our identities. Think about, remember when we were um, simplifying trig expressions, we had five different suggestions of things we could do. Um, those ideas still are quite handy of what? Separate fractions, combine fractions, Pythagorean identities, factor foil, sine and cosine. Like those were our five different suggestions. Those suggestions are still good, along with being familiar with your identities. Okay. Thoughts on tangent x plus cotangent x? Hmm? I like that idea. The idea of changing everything to sine and cosine. Okay. And I'm going to tell you, yes, it's going to work because it's what I've done and it works quite well. However, you know, it's an idea. Even if you don't know if it works, try it. So what do we know about tangent x? It is what? Sine x over cosine x plus what do we know about cotangent x?
cosine x over sine x. Next thought. Common denominator. And I agree. And here's a thought here. Right here we have two fractions. Look at where we're going. When we get to the end, do we have two fractions being added still? No. So these at some point are going to have to combine into one fraction. So I agree. What is my common denominator if I currently have a denominator of cosine and a denominator of sine? Common denominator is? Cosine x, sine x. Okay, first fraction. Currently has a denominator of cosine x. What is it missing from the common denominator? And it's missing a sine x. So what do I have to multiply the numerator by? Sine x. What's sine x times sine x? Sine squared x. Carry down my plus. Second fraction. Currently has a denominator of sine x. What common denominator, what part of the common denominator am I missing? Cosine x. What I multiply the denominator by? I multiply the numerator by. Cosine x times cosine x is cosine squared x. See the next thing? What? The Pythagorean identity. Ah, look at that numerator. Are you recognizing your Pythagorean identities yet? I see squareds being added, squared functions being added or subtraction. Might there be an identity involved? Definitely. Right here is a Pythagorean identity. Okay? So, what do we know sine squared plus cosine squared x is equal to? 1. Still over cosine x sine x. Okay. Next thought. And this is maybe where you pause and look, okay, where am I supposed to be going? Because sometimes if you pause and look, where am I supposed to be going, it makes it more obvious what your next step is. What do you see? Uh -huh. Yeah. Are we basically done? Are we there? And the idea is that a cosine in the denominator... Well, the reciprocal of cosine is secant. And because these are multiplying each other, if they were adding, we couldn't do this. But because they're multiplying, we can just flip them up. So the reciprocal of cosine is secant x. The reciprocal of sine x is cosecant x. Did we make it? We made it. Always write that last step to show me that you got there. Don't just stop at 1 over cosine sine and say, okay, that's good. No. Put, you know, your last step should always be where, where we're supposed to end up. So this is really very similar to what we were doing back in 5.1, wasn't it? Except in 5.1, when we were simplifying these expressions, you didn't know what the final goal was. You were just thinking, well, hopefully I made it. Kind of self-checking in a way. As long as you do legitimate steps, you're going to know if you did this right unless you just happened to end up at the right answer and did some weird steps in the middle, okay? Which, it happens. You guys get desperate or you get confused, then it just magically happens when it doesn't legitimately happen. Okay, questions on that one?
Okay, next problem then. Prove the identity. 1 over secant x minus 1 plus 1 over secant x plus 1 equals 2 cotangent x cosecant x. Okay. I'm going to kind of write out the same thing I've been writing out in that here's my starting point. 1 over secant x minus 1 plus 1 over secant x plus 1 equals what's my goal in the end? My goal is to get down to 2 cotangent x cosecant x. Okay. Our job, fill in the middle. Let's get rid of those fractions. Can we make it be like cosine x minus one plus? Or we can't? We cannot. No. The best, I mean, if you wanted to change the secants, and I don't think I'd recommend that at this point, you could say, okay, this secant is 1 over cosine, but because this is secant x minus 1, no, it's not the same as saying cosine plus 1, or cosine minus 1 in the numerator. Because it's two things, because it's being added or subtracted. Now, if they're being multiplied, yes, <laughs> you can change that. But since it's being added and subtracted, we cannot just change that secant to a cosine and put it in the numerator. And this is, the, you know, this is the skills you guys are learning. And this is why sometimes magic happens on your paper and it looks right, but yet it's, you know, not. Other thoughts? Common denominator. Common denominator. Although it looks ugly right now, it is in your best interest. Okay. You sit there and look and think, ooh, yuck, no. But... What I notice about these denominators, these denominators are conjugates, and that's going to work to my advantage. Okay, so what's my common denominator going to be? If I have a secant x minus 1 and a secant x plus 1. My common denominator is secant x minus 1 times secant x plus 1. So that's what I'm going to write right here. Secant x minus 1. times secant x plus 1. Okay. First fraction. What am I missing? I currently have secant x minus 1. So what do I have to multiply that by? I'm going to multiply that by secant x plus 1. What I do to the denominator? I'm doing to my numerator. What is 1 times secant x plus 1? 1 times secant x plus 1 is secant x plus 1. Then it's going to be plus. Now, same idea with the second fraction. I currently have a denominator of secant x plus 1. What am I missing? I'm missing my secant x minus 1. If I multiply the denominator by secant x minus 1, I'm multiplying my numerator by secant x minus 1. What is 1 times secant x minus 1? Secant x minus 1. Next thoughts. What? Okay. So if we clean up like terms on top, okay, yeah. he's saying get rid of the ones, which, yep. On top, 
A positive 1 and a minus 1 are going to cancel. What is secant x plus secant x? Or what is 1 secant x plus 1 secant x? And that is going to be 2 secant x. Okay, just what is 1x plus 1x? It's 2x. What is 1 secant x plus 1 secant x? 2 secant x. Which, that 2 makes me happy because as I glance down to where I'm supposed to end, oh, this 2 is here, isn't it? That's a good sign. Okay, what about that denominator? Foil it. So I feel like you want to keep it that way, but I feel like foil. We want to foil. And here's the deal, okay? We want to foil that because those are conjugates, and good stuff's going to happen there. I would be a little more hesitant if they weren't conjugates. And not that we might not still want to foil, but I would be a little more hesitant. But because they're conjugates, okay, so secant x times secant x is secant squared x. Outsides would be secant x times positive 1. Insides would be secant x times negative 1. So my outsides and my insides are going to cancel. These are conjugates, typical foil. And what's last? Minus 1 times positive 1, which is minus 1. Okay. Thoughts? Again. What do you see? Uh, the secant squared x minus 1 equals tangent squared x. And what makes that denominator equal tangent squared x? The Pythagorean hydro. Ah. Squared functions, add or subtract with each other and or ones, often warrant, at least warrants us to look at a Pythagorean identity. And so what I'm going to say is I see a secant squared and a 1. What's the Pythagorean identity that involves a secant squared and a 1? Well, side note here, we know it as 1 plus tangent squared x equals secant squared x, right? Can I make 1 plus tangent squared x equals secant squared x? Can I make that look like that denominator? I can. I can subtract the 1 over, subtract the 1 over, and then tangent squared x is equivalent to secant squared x minus 1. Okay, side note there. Every place I see a secant squared x minus 1, I can replace with tangent squared x. So yes, this right here is a PI, Pythagorean identity. So my numerator stays 2 secant x. My denominator becomes tangent squared x. Okay. Making progress. I have the two. We got rid of addition and subtraction, right? We're down to one fraction. We got rid of addition and subtraction, so I'm headed in the right direction. Thoughts about what, where you'd like me to go next? Sorry. We can. And I was just debating. You're going to want to change it to cosine and sine to kind of rearrange the problem. Now, what I was debating is, do we change it to cosine and sine while it's in this fraction form? 
and we can. And there, this is one of those things. There's, you know, there's not necessarily right ways and wrong ways, right? <laughs> there's multiple different options we could go. Because in my notes, what I actually did is I took the tangent squared out of the denominator. And what is tangent squared if I take it out of the denominator and put it in the numerator? It's cotangent squared. And then I change it all to sine and cosine. Now, is that any more right than changing to sine and cosine right now? No, it's not. So you guys want me to do a fraction within fraction, fractions within fractions and then show it that way? I'll do it that way. If we change everything to sines and cosines. Okay, so first of all, 2 secant x. What do we know about secant? Secant is the reciprocal of cosine, right? So 2 secant x, what if I say 2 secant x can be really written as 2 over cosine x? Agreed? Because the 2 is a whole number, right? So 2 has to stay on top. If you put it to the bottom, it becomes 1 half, and you're changing the problem. Over, what do we know about tangent squared? Tangent squared is, or tangent is sine over cosine. So tangent squared is sine squared x over cosine squared x. Now, how do I feel about fractions divided by fractions? I'm going to erase this so I have... Would it be smart to, instead of having a fraction divided by a fraction, make it a fraction multiplied by the reciprocal? So then that means I'm going to keep 2 over cosine x. Instead of dividing by this fraction, I'm going to multiply. Remember, keep, change, flip. I'm multiplying by cosine squared x over sine squared x. What's one thing that can happen here? Cosine on bottom? Can what? Wait, so you can take one of them out? Yes. Okay. Because it's these are these fractions are being multiplied, right? So it's like having an x and an x squared. You can cancel one of the x's. So this is a cosine. I can cancel one cosine on bottom with one of the cosines on top, which takes it from being cosine squared to cosine. Now, because I'm running out of room, I'm going to write it over here. Where? What was my goal? My goal is 2 cotangent x cosecant x, correct? Are you starting to see it? Because we are really just about there, folks. There's supposed to be a 2 out front. Do we have a 2? We have a 2. Then there's supposed to be a cotangent. What do you know about cotangent? Co it's cosine over sine. Do I have a cosine over a sine? I do. There is the stuff there for cosine x over sine x. What do you know about cosecant? Cosecant is 1 over sine. Do I have an extra sine down here that I haven't used yet? All I'm doing is just rewriting this information so it makes sense. Look at what I just wrote compared to what's written above it. The two's still there. There's still one cosine on top, right? And are there two, still two signs on bottom, a sign times a sign? There is. Did I end up where I need to end up? If I change this out now, out of cosines and signs, there's two. Cosine over sine is cotangent x. One over sine x is 
cosecant x. And we made it. Sometimes that last step is just taking what you have and rearranging it to make it look right. To kind of, in a way, check off, okay, do I have all my pieces? Because that's really what I was doing more than anything, is I was just kind of checking off, do I have all my pieces? Once I got right here, I was really kind of done. I had all the pieces. This was just me showing you that I have all the pieces. Showing my understanding. And that's what I expect from you guys. Show me the understanding. Those are all things we've done before, right? All things we've done in this chapter, whether you've liked them or not. Just putting them together. Okay. Try and get one more in here. That was the one that had the most work today, so... And I honestly, I don't even have five done in my notes, so I think I usually run out of time for five. So if we can get through four, we'll be on the right track. Okay. You guys know what I'm going to do at this point? I'm writing out my beginning and my ending. Cosine t over 1 minus sine t. And my goal is to end at... One plus sine t over cosine t. Okay. This is an important one to show because of the first step. It's already on terms of sines and cosines. I can't think Pythagorean identity because that's that's not 1 minus sine squared. That's 1 minus sine. It's already one fraction. And in the end, it's going to be one fraction. So I'm not sure I really want to, I can't really split that up with that denominator as is. Okay. A skill, you've seen this skill before in algebras and stuff. In that denominator, we have 1 minus sine t. Remember, whatever we do to the denominator, we can do whatever we want to the denominator in terms of uh, multiplying and dividing as long as we do the same thing to the numerator, right? Take conjugate. We've done this when rationalizing with radicals and stuff, and that's the same thing we're going to use here. Take conjugate. What is the conjugate of 1 minus sine t? What is the conjugate of 1 minus sine t? And it is 1 plus sine t. Remember conjugate, you keep the terms the same and just change the middle sign. That's what we're going to do. If we multiply the denominator by 1 plus sine t, we're going to multiply the numerator by 1 plus sine t. Okay. So... Multiplying by the conjugate of the denominator is a helpful skill at times. So we're multiplying by 1 plus sine t, numerator and denominator. As we go to multiply these, if we just multiply by the conjugate, what do you think is going to be helpful to do in the denominator? We're going to want to FOIL. The numerator, maybe you want to multiply it out, maybe you don't. It's one of those that's hard to tell. So the numerator, I'm actually not going to multiply out for right now. I'm going to see what happens. But the denominator, I'm going to FOIL. So my numerator, I'm going to keep as just cosine t times 1 plus sine t. My denominator. What do I get when I FOIL? 1 times 1 is 1. 1 times sine t and 1 times negative sine t 
Outsides and insides will cancel. What's minus sine t times positive sine t? One minus sine squared t. Okay. There's one big step here that will get us headed in the right direction. Has to do with that denominator. Pythagorean identity. Pythagorean identity again? It is. If you look at the denominator, it's squared functions added or subtracted with ones. And so the Pythagorean identity that we're familiar with is sine squared theta plus cosine squared theta equals one. Can I make that look like one minus sine squared? I can. Subtract the sine squared theta over. And do you have to show this visual that I'm doing off to the side? You don't. You are more than welcome to do that in your heads. And I know some of you do. Okay. I'm sure, again, it's a teaching thing for me. I'm showing it, but I'm not saying you have to. This is just kind of a side note of where it's coming from. So it doesn't look like magic. Every place I see a 1 minus sine squared, I can replace it with cosine squared. So again, think PI, Pythagorean identity. So I'm going to leave my numerator. Cosine t times 1 plus sine t. Denominator, 1 minus sine squared is going to be replaced with cosine squared t, because we're working with t's. Do you see it? We're there, folks. Last step. What do I need to do? Yeah. This cosine on top is being multiplied by 1 plus sine. So either a cosine can cancel or a 1 plus sine can cancel. My denominator, I have cosine times cosine. So the 1 cosine on top can cancel with one of the cosines on bottom. What remains when I cancel those cosines out? On top there is 1 plus sine t. On bottom there is cosine t. Hey, guess what? That's where I was supposed to end, isn't it? I made it. Okay? I made it. When we did this back in Lesson 5.1, would you have thought you were done here? Not necessarily, because that doesn't look like a final product. But again, we're just trying to prove that these are equal. Okay, and this is what I'm looking for on homework. Fill in the steps in from the beginning to the end. Yes? Can we just do the first step of 5? Because I don't want to like look at it tonight and be like, what the heck am I doing? I'm trying to get how much there's anything like five. I would probably say, without having it in front of me, where I would start is trying to multiply by the conjugate and the denominator. Now, I don't have it worked out in front of me, but that's where I would start, try starting. Now, before I forget, I'm going to put it in here. Your homework is on page 418. Up on the board, I have written 12 through 39 multiples of 3. Count with me. 12, 15, 18, 21, 24, 27, 30, 33, 36, and 39. So no excuses to come in having done a wrong problem tomorrow, right? I'm trying to prevent it. Okay, I will, I will plan to answer questions tomorrow. That is my plan for tomorrow. Attempt all 10 problems, and hopefully you can figure some of them out. Okay? Do tomorrow, but not do tomorrow.
probably, I'm thinking do at the end of the period, but we'll see how things go. Okay. I mean, like, after I go through questions with you. Okay?